I mentioned I'm Paul Kelly. I'm uh, our pre-sales and delivery lead here in North America, um, which basically means I do a little bit of everything uh, in the, the record point structure at the moment. Uh, I was originally from Perth, Australia, which I was talking to a few of you about uh, during the, uh, the mingling session. Moved over here about two years ago, uh, and before that time, had actually been working more in the consulting space with a couple of uh, large and smaller SIs through, uh, throughout Australia. Uh, actually worked with the first Nintex consulting arm, OBS. For those of you who know of or use Nintex, given we're in uh, we're in Redmond, but for anyone that's over in Bellevue, if you haven't heard of Nintex, uh, you've probably been living under a rock because it's a very well known add in for SharePoint. Um, we've actually just had one of their guys join us as a uh, new VP of sales as well. And they were uh, started out of uh, Melbourne, we were started out of Sydney. We're funded by the same companies, uh, a lot of DNA shared in, in both of those companies. Um, over the last 10 years, since Record Point's been around, we have spread our wings around the, the globe. Uh, so we were, as I mentioned, founded out of Australia, where we still have a large contingent of our workforce, about uh, 40 to 50 of our team are still located across Sydney and Melbourne. Uh, we opened up our North American headquarters uh, about four years ago now. All of our C-level team members are there, so our CEO, CTO, CFO, etc., etc., are all located uh, right down the road in Bellevue. Um, just near the, uh, the 405 there. Uh, we've moved offices a couple of times because we keep growing a little bit quicker than expected and, and we're about 12 months into our latest lease and ready to break it again. Um, we're just opening up our Canadian data centre, which is very exciting. Uh, there were some announcements a couple of weeks ago and we're up in Calgary to celebrate that. Uh, and we've been operating out of the United Kingdom uh, for the last sort of five, six years as well. Uh, globally, there's about 80 of us. Uh, we've got about 120 customers across pretty much any regulated industry. We work very closely with public sector. I think uh, probably about 65, 70% of our customers are all public sector, um, local, state, uh, federal, central. Um, and uh, and uh, earlier this year, we were actually uh, recognized by Gartner as a cool vendor, uh, which basically means that uh, we're seen as an up and comer in this new content services market segment. Uh, has anyone heard of content services? Is it a term you're starting to hear a little bit more regularly? Anyone that reads Chris McNulty's blog uh, will hear all about content services. Uh, it's a big push for Microsoft. Uh, and in the industry at large, what we're seeing now is a shift away from that traditional enterprise content management space, which is put everything in a really big bucket and just kind of hope we can find it again, um, to now uh, content services, which are um, applications that are deriving specific business value for your organization, being able to manage all of that content across the various applications through its entire life cycle. Microsoft has its own version of the life cycle. If you go and talk to Armour and AIM and all of the industry um, our sort of practice leaders, they all have their methodologies around the life cycle and we try and uh, design a solution that fits into all of them in a fairly sensible way. Why we're here today uh, is to talk a little bit about compliance. Uh, why does it matter? What is it? How do we do it? What's the problem if we don't do it? And then what's Record Point's view on tackling that problem for organizations? Uh, so firstly, I don't think this will come to anyone, uh, any, any great surprise to anyone, but why does it matter? Um, firstly, you can get fined pretty significantly if you're not compliant with various regulations. Um, uh, 2018 is a really interesting year because everyone obviously saw GDPR get launched back on the, anyone know the date off the top of the head? Any GDPR experts here? Okay, good. I don't need to pretend to be then, so that's fine. Um, it's a little test for everyone. Uh, so it's the 25th of March, 2018, now on a GDPR day, that everyone's Gmail accounts fill up with like 400 emails that day as everyone changed their privacy policies, their cookie acceptances, their terms of service. Uh, it, was, it was a nightmare. Um, I had a lot of spam that day. Fines not only relate to the records management standards that we have to meet and some of the audits that, we, uh, that we'll go through on an annual or sometimes every sort of two or three year basis, but now the data privacy breaches as well. Right? So how are we actually protecting our information and then how we're making sure that we know what information we have, what um, that information pertains to, whether that's consumer or personal information, PII data, uh, we're talking a little bit about HIPAA earlier as well, and then how are we making sure that we're not breaching the data privacy regulations now, which are getting a whole lot more complex by the day. When we talk about some of those regulations, uh, for local government, we obviously have the Public Records Act here in Washington State. Uh, that's the primary act that local government is trying to meet, but then, as you can see listed here, there are dozens of other ones. Uh, anyone know any of the regulations, any of the uh, acronyms up there? 
at not including GDPR. CJUS. So uh, criminal justice, yep. So very important, that's not just about uh, uh, the data itself, but where it's stored, who has access to it. Uh, people like myself, Australians, we're not allowed to access that information. We can't even work on the infrastructure, which ties together with something called SIP, which is so critical information. There we go. So do it close. So uh, yeah, I figured you tie that all together around. Um, we then have like up in Canada, by like PETA, DPA, that's the Privacy Act, uh, kind of their version of GDPR. CCPA is launching 1st of January 2020, which is the California Consumer Protection Act. Uh, that's basically GDPR light here for the US. And that will spread like wildfire through the 49 other states until someone somewhere hopefully just says let's have a federal standard for everyone, uh, which is uh, already being talked about now. And I think Facebook's terrified of that coming in. We then have Discovery. Um, so compliance is not just about preserving and protecting our information, but actually helping you discover it in a more easier fashion as well. There are huge costs to be saved if you actually know what you have, where it is, and how to get to it quickly, rather than pointing lawyers to the big bucket down the hall and saying, good luck finding things when we need it. So how do we actually start to empower you a little bit more to know what you have, where it is, how long you need to keep it for, and then how to serve that up when required. Uh, and then finally, reporting. Um, so on the, the back of actually being able to find it, actually being able to keep metrics on what we actually have as an organization. And in that old ECM world, a lot of the time people would just point to the big ECM and say, well, they're all our records. And that was kind of a get out of jail free card for them just ignoring everything else. Uh, is there anyone here that uses this like dynamic CRM? Or for the non-Microsofties, a Salesforce or an ERP, an SAP, those types of tools? Uh, I often think organizations have a lot more highly valuable critical information in those systems than they do in their document management tool. Uh, and the easy way to weigh that up is if the document management platform goes down for a day, you're probably quite inconvenienced. You're probably not losing money or potentially putting people's operating licenses, potential lives at risk. Um, don't know about Blue Web, if we suddenly didn't know who was patrolling today, that might be a little bit more of an issue of why you want to keep SharePoint live. But um, but if your dynamics goes down, if you have uh, SAP and you can't serve your customers, if you can't track your assets that are in operation, if you've got things that are powering uh, self-service kiosk on a website, that goes down and suddenly you're losing revenue. And that's really critical data that we don't think about as records. Right? So how do we start to report across all of these systems and understand what do we have, where is it, what do we need to do with it? We obviously see daily uh, issues from organizations that are non-compliance. Uh, Enron is always the classic example that comes up. Um, anyone know a very large company in North California in the last couple of weeks that's dealing with a very big compliance issue? Maria? Sorry? Maria? No, but I'm going to look that one up because I don't know that one. So a uh, little bit bigger. Facebook. Facebook's always dealing with problems. <laughs> I don't think they care though. Um, they will just pay whoever they need to pay. Um, now I'm referring to Pacific Gas and Electric, uh, the Californian wildfires, um, and their uh, their assets that uh, seem like they were not being properly maintained as they should, which caused those fires. Uh, so right now they are sifting through bucket loads of information, trying to determine if those assets were actually being operated correctly. And with some simple records management measures, they'd actually be able to say who was on site, who was doing what, and they have the right procedures and policies. Will be up to code with the compliance and regulations that we needed to keep. And their stock price went down about 50%. And they did, yeah. I almost thought about buying it. So, um, but uh, I don't know if it's going to potentially give there further. So we'll uh, wait and see what happens. Uh, funnily enough, they may very soon be a record point customer, but uh, we're not taking responsibility for the wildfires at any point. Um, the other reason why compliance is important is over time, um, the cost of information increases, right? So. The, the value of the information tends to dip and the cost goes up. Over time as well, sorry, my animation's a little bit back here as well, the risk profile that that information creates for your organization increases and the cost associated with that risk increases as well. So right now I would hazard to guess that somewhere in all of your organizations there is content that you can legally dispose of that you haven't, that you may not realize you can. And right now if a litigation activity occurs, you are required to hand that information over. We just recently rolled out uh, a OneDrive connector for Enbridge up in Canada. Um, they've got about 16,000 users. They had their early adopters program of 500 people, 
and they migrated all of their content off their personal file share drives into their OneDrives. And we had our program sitting behind the scenes monitoring that. Uh, in the first weekend, they put 300,000 documents up in the OneDrive, and we identified 40,000 in that first couple of days that were already overdue to be disposed of, that they could instantly just purge. That's about 15% of the content that went up there on day one, ready to go, that they had no idea about, just running through our rules engine, looking at the semantics of the data and being able to action that. So uh, they were quite visibly excited by the possibilities when they go to the other 15,000 plus people in the organization. And that's just one drive. That's not talking about SharePoint, file share, and anything else. And the final factor of this is a lot of the time, if I just flip forward here, because it gets a little bit boring going one at a time, um, the majority of our content has next to no value in it. So we just tend to hoard it, right? We keep it because we don't know what to do with it. So our file shares fill up, our SharePoint sites fill up. Things like SharePoint search not working, that's because people just put everything in the SharePoint and they don't do anything with it. It just sits there. The indexes get harder to crawl, they get harder to maintain, it gets more and more difficult to sift through the rubbish, right? So how do we actually start to help you actively dispose of that content, reduce those costs and provide more uh, a more usable solution for your, for your users? And this is all then summed up as part of the ongoing compliance challenge that we see in 2018 and as we step into 2019, isn't it getting any easier? And uh, I'm sure that this is familiar to everyone. We have data growing at exponential rates, right? So more and more data coming from more and more systems by more and more people every day. We lack a single federated view of where that information is. So right now, I need to go to a file share to find something. I think David had the great example of a, uh, it was a, a, a timesheet system or something, right? Oh, the form. Right? Copy yeah, so I don't have a single source of truth for this one document, right? So me as the end user, I know there's a copy sitting on a file share, so I'll go and look at there. Someone else is going into SharePoint, someone else has a copy in their OneDrive, and then finally someone knows that they've actually automated the timesheet system that's actually sitting in a workflow system somewhere else, right? So right there, you're lacking that single federation to actually see what we have, where it is, and which one is the single source of truth record. And finally, the federated controls that we need to place get more and more complex because the regulations keep changing. We have the State Record Acts, we have the Privacy Acts, we have Audit and Accountability Acts, we have uh, 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 GAS Act, which is the General Accounting Standards, I can't remember the rest of the acronym, that NARA run when they come looking at your data every three years. So uh, we need to continually be evolving how we meet those standards. And then finally, how do we do all of that without asking the end users to become records managers? Right? Like how do we keep it really easy for them so that we don't burden them with having to create 20 fields of metadata every time they upload a document, without having to declare something as a record, without having to provide a classification, to be able to basically just use the tools as they were designed, right? which is really the mantra that we follow here at Record Point. Uh, we have a very simple saying. A record is not a record because someone decided that it was a record. It's a record because it's a record, right? There are regulations and policies out there that tell you what a record is. And putting that in the hands of every end user that you have is a fairly risky game to play. And so we want to take that burden away from them with our platform and allow you to use tools like SharePoint, OneDrive, Teams, Groups, FileShare, Box, Dropbox, the list goes on, as they were designed to use. We want places like Redmond PD to be able to roll out something like Blue Web, completely unencumbered by, hang on, we didn't factor in the records management standards. So what do we need to redesign? Why can't we roll out uh, you know, governance processes to each champion to let them do what they want? Oh, because they've got to meet the records management standards. They don't know what that is, and they don't care what they are. So from that perspective, if you were building that with a records management solution in mind, it would look a lot different. We don't want it to look different. We want it to be fit for purpose, right? We sit behind the scenes. We manage everything for you. And so if we take a look visually at Sort of what that looks like, as I mentioned, we're coming from this old world space, right? This is our big bucket ECM solution. The likes of an open text, a documentum, a file net, a trim, an objective. There's dozens of them out there, right? And they've all kind of grown up from the physical records management methods into the electronic world. And then they've just kind of ballooned to try and be this one size fits all solution for organizations. And unfortunately, that one size fits all actually creates a system that's not really fit for anyone because it's trying to put compliance first, and the end users don't appreciate that. Uh, I always say to uh, change managers, 
You want to eliminate every problem you're going to have with a project really quickly. Just say records management, because then everyone will just disappear. Um, there is no quicker way to get people to flock away from a system to say you put your records in it. Right? Pains me as a records manager to say that, but it's the truth. Right? So we don't want to promote SharePoint and OneDrive as record keeping tools. We want them to be productive, collaboration, online, cloud services. They're all modern and cool, and you can use these things on them. And the millennials coming in are happy to use them. If I say you need to go and put something in the antiquated on-prem card VPN into a records management tool, we're done, right? Conversation <laughs> over, leaves the room. Um, so that has been the model to date. The other problem with this model, as I mentioned earlier, is it just ignores everything else, right? So all those other systems out there, if it doesn't constrain to our ECM as a records manager, not my problem, right? So meanwhile, all of that high value, really critical information that's sitting in these systems, just goes completely unmanaged. In this new world of content services, what we're actually doing is we're leveraging each service as it's designed. Anyone here using any of those other than Office 365, because obviously this is the SharePoint user group? Box, Dropbox, Slack, anyone? They're all just, <laughs> not they're all just Microsoft. Not companies, officially right? using those, but okay. yeah. Is this bug? Is someone from Microsoft listening to this session now and is you know waiting to go? They're a box user, get them. Um, so from our approach, each of these services provide different uh, capabilities, uh, different needs to your user base, right? We have Office 365, which obviously kind of does a little bit of everything. That's providing highly structured, rigid taxonomies in a SharePoint, more ephemeral, transitory content in OneDrive, collaboration across teams and groups. You can even start to do like webcasts and video uploads and things like stream now, right? We then have some like, organizations that aren't quite as regimented, uh, so they'll start to use things like Box and Dropbox and Google Drive, not always government agencies. Uh, there are a couple out there using Box, but more sort of on the law firm side, smaller commercial entities that don't need all the rigor, they just don't want to use file shares. They want to put it in the cloud where it's protected, it's preserved, it's all in there in the one place. And then we have uh, companies that are using things like Slack from a conversational aspect, right? Uh, those are normally organizations that have not adopted anything by Microsoft. The one thing that all of these services have in common is they were born in the cloud, right? They didn't start with that on-prem legacy. SharePoint, you can debate, did, but SharePoint Online Office 365 was born in the cloud, right? The architecture, everything, the plumbing largely changed, right? The rest of these services were all born in the cloud, so they weren't encumbered by any of those ECM traits that weigh down those heavy systems. They also provide different levels of trust so Office 365 has things like ADG built in, some labeling, some retention policies. You can do some lightweight records management in there. Dropbox has nothing. Box has governance, which they think is records management. It's not. Uh, and then finally, you have things like file shares that are just completely unstructured, messy buckets. The way we use these systems has also evolved. Uh, so we now leverage mobile devices extensively. I talked to an agency last week where we were talking about their field operations, and they said, oh, we have iPads in the field. Their iPads connect to the applications in the cloud that they need to use, but because their ECM is on-prem and can't be accessed via the iPad, they use the iPad when they're in the field, they fill out all the data, they save it locally, they bring it back to head office, they download that onto their computer, and then they upload it to the ECM. So through that entire process, one, Information is not centrally available to anyone. There are risks where data could get lost. It's been completely unprepared, uh, unmanaged, sorry. And finally, it doesn't sound like the most productive use of their time, right? When really what I want to do is use these devices to get natively to these tools and just do my job there and then. And then finally, through those services and those devices, those user behaviors are starting to change. Um, yes. Me. Um, I just wanted, I should have done it earlier, but um, Joe, is is Paul coming in clearly via Skype? Yes, it is. Perfect. Thanks, Thanks Joe. Good information. So when we talk about the users, um, anyone worked with the systems where you're going to check in, check out? <coughs> right, everyone's been there, right? Uh, especially earlier in our careers where that was the only way to do it. Um, if you had a millennial coming into the workplace now and you said, yeah, you can't do your job until that person checks that back in, they, uh, they probably, one, wouldn't know what you're talking about, two, that would flip out a little bit, right? Everyone wants to be able to do everything instantly. I want to be able to sit on my couch at 10 o'clock at night and not just reply to an email, but get into OneDrive, find the document I'm using, share it with that person, have a conversation with them in Teams, and do it without having to leave the cushion that I'm already sitting on, right? 
So this has really changed the behaviors from our user base of how they work with their information, right? It needs to be readily available, has to be 24 by 7, anytime, any device, anywhere. We've heard those things before. So this is a great story. We have all these cloud technologies that are best of breed, that are providing specific uh, business uh, uh, support for us. We have users that are now using mobile devices, and we have our information everywhere. Unfortunately, the records manager, this is what they see. It's just chaos, right? it's nightmare. Data's everywhere, information's everywhere, my users won't listen to me, they're doing everything however they want to do it. I can't control the devices, I have no real power to preserve and protect our information as we need to. And this is only getting harder and harder. I might have five applications up there, but we all know that there's hundreds in the organization that can potentially fit this model. David, you've migrated a lot of these, right? You know how complex that landscape can get, right? Uh, how difficult it can be to get that federated view. And so about four years ago at Record Point, uh, we were uh, working with SharePoint. We had our on-premise tool, we had our cloud tool, Records 365, uh, and we were working predominantly with SharePoint and OneDrive and the Microsoft stack. And we made a decision about four years ago to move towards this model because we knew that one, SharePoint wasn't going to be the only system around forever, and two, we knew that that ECM model of everything going into one place all the time was changing, right? We had to evolve our own platform to meet this issue, knowing it was coming down the path. And so with our next generation platform, which is the next version of Record 365, what we're helping organizations do is get control over all of those different information repositories. Be it Office 365 with OneDrive, SharePoint, Teams, Groups, Stream, etc. your file shares, Box, Dropbox, all of those core enterprise used content management solutions. And we aim that middle piece there of our platform only on the records managers. So the reason Tacoma likes to talk about record point is because while they have 3,600 staff that they're rolling SharePoint out to, they have a handful of records managers that use record point. We're not part of their change management plan, we're not part of any operational readiness. The end users have no idea that we exist. We sit seamlessly in the background. So they use the tools that they've been provided with completely unencumbered, and we sit in the middle or behind it all, targeting the records managers and providing all of the records management controls, the federation, the policies, the automation, and the defensible practices around disposal and life cycle management without the end user being any the wiser. And without impacting any of those systems. So that's a little bit about, I guess, our story, our journey, why compliance matters and what we're doing to fight that battle. Um, now I'd like to show you this live because most people don't believe that we can actually do this. And uh, anytime I go to an ARM or an AIM and they see the visualizations, they get excited, but there's also a little bit of skepticism. Um, so now I'll, uh, I'll jump over into our platform and uh, give you guys a live look. Before I do, any questions on any of that? Any non-believers yet? We do, yeah. So, so we have three different types of connectors. We have our first party connectors, which are ones that we at Record Point have produced. They're all the core ones that you see up here, the SharePoint, the OneDrives, etc. We then have third party connectors that we license through either SIs or other technology vendors. So we actually work with a company called Zilio, uh, with a with an X uh, over in Europe that have uh, a bunch of uh, connectors into legacy on-prem ECM solutions. And David, I don't know if you've come across them in your migration pass. Um, so they have connectors into about, I want to say like 15 or so different ECM products. The Documentums, the, the Open Text, et cetera, of the world. Uh, so we don't connect into, well, they don't connect into LaserFish. So the third type of connector that we have, which isn't just ready to go out of the box, is our custom connectors. So the API that we use as part of our connectors framework, the software development kit, everything is natively available for you as a customer through your licensing to leverage. So if you did want to connect down into a line of business application or a legacy ECN that we didn't have, we can either work with you to design that connector, or you can just take that yourself if you've got the in-house uh, engineers or developers, you can go and build your own connectors completely for free. And it's all there on GitHub published to walk you through how to do that. Uh, these are not heavy-handed integrations. This is a one-way pull of your information. It's a monitoring service and a preservation service. So building connectors is actually relatively straightforward. Uh, the average connector to get production ready for a customer that isn't an SAP or a Salesforce, et cetera, uh, which is just a, a data pool, it's about 10 days of effort. 
So this is about a six month development exercise with layers and layers of testing. Any other questions? One's all good, just kind of wants to see it working now. <laughs> all right, so I will apologize, I will, um, we'll come and stand over here. Um, so I will yell as much as I can. <laughs> and let's have a look at all of this work. Uh, I just want to confirm, uh, Joe, you can still see the screen now. We've got a, a live screen up. And I'm just yep. moving my camera a little bit. Looks good. Perfect. Uh, so this is Record 365, this is our next-gen platform. This is hosted on Microsoft Azure using uh, the service fabric and a variety of Azure services behind the scenes as far as uh, storage, searching, indexing, um, uh, around being as performance as possible. Uh, we built this platform as well uh, to move away from SharePoint purely because of some of the limitations of SharePoint at that time. Um, so we wanted to scale into the hundreds of millions of records for customers because we knew that's where our enterprise customers were gonna end up. Uh, when we first started testing the platform, the goal was a billion items um, at a point in future that we haven't hit yet. We're about half a billion items per day now of record ingestion. And we tested that against the NASDAQ feeds. Um, so if you wanna if you want to test data feeds, pick the NASDAQ just because of the amount of transactions on a daily basis. We were able to keep up with the public feeds that were available as we ingested that through. Uh, it's both vertically and horizontally uh, scalable based on the customer's needs and how much data they have coming. Uh, this is the dashboard that's only targeted at the records managers. So you can let everyone in. Uh, it's a consumption-based license, so we don't care about how many users you have. You can have one user or 100,000 users completely up to you, all security trimmed. But generally speaking, records managers, information managers, uh, governance type people, legal counsel, are generally the only people that need to come in. Right now, uh, I'm connected to seven different content sources that we can see here. Uh, you can see I've got a lot of content coming from SharePoint, from Exchange Online, OneDrive, Box.com, uh, the file shares, uh, Google Drive, and then finally physical records, which is a big requirement for records managers, and one that you can't facilitate without going completely custom within SharePoint. We then have the aggregations of the records themselves, which are kind of document list level items. Uh, they're folders, which again changes depending on the content source, and physical boxes, uh, which you can see that little yellow split there. And then finally, the record categories. Uh, for anyone in the room that's not familiar with sort of the core records management fundamentals, uh, the categories are our classifications, right? This is how we identify what the item is, and that enforces the retention policies which inform how long we need to keep it, what we need to do with it. So they're generally linked um, as, as both a, a group. We have our file plan, we have our retention schedules we bring together. Because I've got seven connected sources, I can actually see all of my active connectors uh, over here on the connectors page. You can see I'm currently monitoring each of those sources and each connector is very easy to set up. So for SharePoint Online, it's a four-step process. Link it to SharePoint, confirm which sites I want to manage, confirm the aggregation level, confirm the version. That's it. You can literally be connected to SharePoint in minutes. Uh, if you go and look at some of the other connectors, uh, they're a little bit different. So Box obviously doesn't have quite as many capabilities as SharePoint, so the connector, while it looks largely the same, doesn't provide things like the version controls, doesn't provide things like managing sites, because Box doesn't know what the site is. Uh, each of these connectors is available via the gallery here, so you can come in and add them. I've got a couple of additional custom connectors and beta connectors there, uh, such as Salesforce, uh, connectors in HP Trim, which is a legacy ECM back in Australia that they use quite extensively. And this is where your custom connectors will also be stored if you want to introduce them. Once we've got the connectors live, the record metadata starts coming in. Uh, I'll just uh, zoom in here a little bit for you so you can see uh, is actually a responsive design as well. Uh, not for the browser view, but I'll show you some other views in a little bit. Uh, here we have the format of the record, the uh, file name or title, the record number we're appending, uh, some other metadata related to the record itself, and then most importantly, uh, the retention and disposal schedule. So you can see that a lot of the items I have right now are due to be destroyed. Uh, we can see how we over that, uh, we're getting destroyed there, and then we have the time period in which it will become eligible. So this first item, uh, I can't destroy it for 20 more years, right? That's a long one, that's way out. Don't need to worry about that right now. 
If I come down to this one that has an amber alert on it, you can actually see it's due in seven days. They can't dispose it yet, but it's getting close. Right? And as part of that disposal exercise, where you don't just want to hoard data forever, this is highlighting those items that are soon going to be eligible to go through the defensible disposal process. And if we actually come over to uh, page three or four of a couple, once they're overdue, we highlight them red. Right? So it's a visual indicator to actually say, as the records manager, you should be taking action on this. We have some other mechanisms about how we report that. You don't need to sit through a list. Because uh, some of our customers that have tens of millions of records, there'd be a lot of uh, page crawl at that point. Finally, you'll see the content source here. Where's it coming from? Because we can manage a whole range of content sources, it's important to know where the content is. Uh, and as we go and look at each record, let's come back to the first page. So I'll open up a SharePoint document here. I can get a summary view of how it's been categorized. I can see where it is, I can see the version, I can see whether it's on a legal poll, and then I can actually come in and look at all of the details. For anyone that's familiar with SharePoint, you can actually see, here's the SharePoint metadata, here's everything we bring in. This is all indexed, searchable, it's reportable, you can write rules against it, and it automatically maps both system generated and custom fields. And I'll demonstrate what that looks like in a moment. We also capture, as I mentioned, the legal holds, full version history of everything that happens to this item throughout its life, and then a full order trail of not only what's happening in the content source, but what's happening over in the record system as well. So this is your master order trail. Someone's editing the document, that's great, we want to track it. We also saw that Jeff went and rescheduled it, and then he set it for disposal, and then Gail approved it, and then came back to Jeff and he disposed of it. All of that information is here. This is the single metadata stuff that you need to provide for litigants. So if we uh, come back to the browser and we take off our uh, records management hat, uh, let's go and actually create some content as an end user. Uh, so this is a system called SharePoint. Is everyone familiar with SharePoint? Checking. Sorry, it's a standard question that I have to ask. You'd be surprised at how many people on a demo don't know SharePoint. Uh, so um, this is obviously a SharePoint online environment. We work with SharePoint on-prem, 13, 16, 19. So you'll find it pretty much run the gamut. I didn't want to ask him what version they were using, but it looks a little bit like 10. 10. Is that everyone else's? I was guessing 10 or 15, yeah. It's yeah, 10. So, it's right. at least 10. <laughs> well, yeah, because it's on the left up there. It, it looks 10-ish to me, which is why I didn't want to ask it, because uh, I would have helped me. Um, I can't wait to see Blue Web up in a nice play SharePoint online environment. I'm sure David's going to be talking to him straight after the session. So. Um, so right here, we have a very, very vanilla looking financial management side. I'm a SharePoint IA guy, I'm not a designer, so uh, don't hold me accountable. I'm going to come into a very simple contracts library, and here, you can actually see we're using the modern experience. We don't care whether you're modern, whether you're classic, whether you've got plugins, whether you're using tools like Nintex or uh, Caligo or anything like that, we don't care. Uh, as long as the information lands here, we can monitor it. Uh, anyone in here familiar with document sets? I love document sets. Yeah, right. They're better than folders. It's still a folder though. Um, so uh, I like to use document sets here just because it highlights that we're not restrictive around how you structure the data. So you can use folders, you can use doc sets, you can use a flat library, you can use lists, you can put any metadata in, you can use content types, you can publish from a hub, you can have a term set. We don't care. Uh, as I mentioned, completely non prescriptive to how you use SharePoint. Uh, I'm just going to very simple content type here called contract. And as a contract officer, I'm going to come in and I'm going to call this uh, my, uh, I'm just going to say LG Spark contract. I'm going to select a customer name from my term set here. I'm going to give it a contract value. And we're going to end the contract on the 31st of December. And I think we can all agree that that was not records meant done. Right, that was related to the contract itself, but the contract officer should know. If the contract officer doesn't know who the contractor is, what the value of the contract is, and when it expires, they're probably not creating a contract file at that point. Right? So what we're trying to illustrate here is we didn't declare anything, we didn't attach classifications, and we didn't have 30 other metadata fields that were completely unnecessary. The way I've set up my SharePoint environment is to go and just automate the creation of a, of a document inside the document set for me. Uh, if you don't do that, it's a great way to uh, help automate that process a little bit with templates, things like that. And then finally, uh, I've inherited all the metadata. 
So the other thing we don't want is the end user having to recapture this information every time they upload something. So if you turn on column sharing or inheritance, then uh, you'll avoid that. What's going on in the background right now is we're monitoring this, we're picking this up, we're creating all of the records metadata, we're classifying the information, we're applying the retention and disposal schedule, we're doing all the heavy lifting while the end users just continues to work with the content here. Yeah. The final thing I'll harp on, just again, no mention of records 365 anywhere. Nothing in the ribbons, nothing in the ECB menu. We still call it the ECB menu, given I've got SharePoint experts probably. People still use that term? No, the three dots? Yeah, okay. Uh, and then, uh, so you can see, there's nothing in here about Records 365. I can go and edit this online, share it with all of you. We could all co-author it. We could have minor major versions on. I think you get the point. Over in Records 365 now, here's my browser. Let's hit refresh. And you can see we have two new items sitting at the top of my list. I have my contract folder, which has been created as a records folder. And I have that first document that was created automatically by SharePoint. You can see that it's been given a disposal schedule of five years. When I've opened it up, we've identified it as a minor contract. So I've already noticed that this is a contract. We'll talk about why it's a minor contract a little bit. And you can see that in a couple of seconds that it took to ingest that data, we've brought all of this across from SharePoint. Most of this data is not searchable in SharePoint, by the way, as well. It doesn't get exposed through the search API. So uh, making this available to records managers uh, is something that they like a lot. The other thing you'll see is all of those custom columns that I've built out regarding the contract, the customer from the term set, even the term set path and the term set ID is all captured here and searchable right now. Finally, you're going to tell us how it's new to apply to Fire. Yeah, yeah. I will, uh, I'll give you a peek behind the camera. Uh, so the final element of this is the version history. Uh, you can see we only have one version right now. So we're going to do some things with the version. Before we do that, to uh, segue to Jeff's question, let's talk about why this is a minor contract. Uh, so first, everyone knows what a file plan is, generally speaking. So a file plan helps us identify what the item is. Uh, for anyone that's a government agency, you're probably just using the standard retention and disposal schedules and file plans published by the state of WA. Um, you've probably got uh, sort of the 80 20 rule where you have it a little bit customized specifically to what you do as an organization. Um, Gail, you might be the exception given you're in a commercial enterprise, so you can kind of just do what you want to meet. I'm assuming CFR is construction, um, the Code of Federal Regulations is your yes. primary. Right? right, so, um, so there's a couple of different ways you can go about meeting that. Um, it's all hierarchical. Once you've seen one file plan, you've seen them all. Very easy to add new categories. You can import this in from the CSV if you've got it. We often build these uh, the first day of implementation. Down here under procurement, I've got a sub-level of contracts, and then under contracts, I have my minor and major contract categories. If we open up minor contracts, we can see some of the mandatory file plan fields. What's the name of it? Where does it inherit from? What disposal authority are your meetings? This is where you'd actually reference the WA state retention and disposal schedules. Uh, if you are a government entity that needs to transfer content to NARA as part of DOD search, things like that, you can toggle that down. And if you need to capture whether it's vital, you can capture that as well. Most importantly, though, this is where we set up the retention schedule. And you can see right now I have a five year retention based on the, ex the expiration date of the contract, which is a custom metadata like that we created over at SharePoint. If we open this up and have a look at it, just zoom in really far for everyone here, we have the four industry standard or ISO standard disposal outcomes. I can destroy it, keep it, transfer it to someone else, and I just simply review it if I'm not sure what to do with it just yet. Once I've selected what happens with the record, I can determine how long I need to keep it before that action gets applied. And then finally, I pick the field in which we calculate when that clock starts ticking. And you can see I have some common fields that go across all of our connectors, and then I have the connector-specific fields. SharePoint, OneDrive, physical fields, box.com, exchange, uh, anything else that I might have connected that has custom fields associated with it. Most importantly, when we talk about that world of content services, I could have a minor contract that lives in multiple systems. So I might have minor contracts that sit in SharePoint, 
We might have minor contracts that still sit on file share for some reason. I might have someone uploading minor contracts to their OneDrive. And so I can actually set up multiple triggers on this schedule so that regardless of where we find the minor contract, we can still trigger the retention period based off the available dates. Yeah. So how do you tell if it's a minor contract in like OneDrive? That's the very next question where we're going. If you come down one layer in our menu here, that's where we start talking about the rules that we set up, where we program how the platform determines what something is. And I'm going to talk about how we do it now and how we're going to do it in the very, very, very near future. So <laughs> on your action, you to store and kind of review. Um, I know with our uh, archives, there's a bit of loss, but uh, sometimes it has to be appraised. So I'm thinking it's kind of like a review, but is the review an internal review or is it a review externally? I mean, it, it, it's really up to you about how you kind of want to determine what the review is. Um, all the review saying is, is it going to be disposable until that status changes? No, right? So we're not going to offload it to a, uh, a glacier storage for an archive or anything like that. And at no point can you carry out a disposal until its retention schedule says you can. So until you review it and reschedule it, and that could happen either manually, it's something you carry out as a records manager, I've reviewed this contract, it actually is a minor contract five years from that date. Or you could say, uh, I've reviewed it, it's actually been in the wrong place in SharePoint, I'm going to move it now, or we're going to clean up this site and move it over here, and the rules will then pick it up and reapply the right schedule at that point. So it's kind of up to you to define what that review really means. Uh, another question on the, on the, the after or uh, like the inception period, like when it first starts to become a record, mm -hmm. like that, um, and then when it's due for, uh, and the like, are there any custom events that we can put in there? Or, um, yeah, absolutely. Yep. So it's completely up to you when those triggers occur, and then how we trigger different events in the schedule as well. I, I mean, I'm just thinking kind of like if there's a lawsuit or something that's happening, I mm -hmm. find uh, technical. Trigger until a certain place in the lawsuit. Or yes. Yep. Trial. Yes, you can do that. I mean, there's a couple of different ways that you can set that up depending on whether you want to do that client side in SharePoint or just over in Record 365. We even have a customer right now that's uh, exploring the use of the connector framework to not produce a connector, but actually just connect into a different Actually, system. I remember now what it was. Um, so there's like major trial ones and there's things that are not important that <laughs> didn't get media attention. Right. That sort of thing. So, the, the trials that warranted interest from outside parties had a different inception date or kind of a because of that. <laughs> and so what you could do there is, let's say our contract is five years from the contract expiration, and we're three years into that, right? The contract expired three years ago, and the litigation activity occurs, right? So you put it all on hold as that activity occurs, and the schedule has not changed, which just to stop the clock now. Right? So while it's on legal hold, even if it's on legal hold for the next 10 years, you can't dispose of it. It's so locked down that you can't even get to an option to potentially accidentally dispose of this information, right? I mean, totally almost permanent. Exactly, right? When it comes out of the legal hold at that point, you could actually state that you want to reschedule the item to now be two years from the legal hold end date, right? So you could change triggers like that depending on what you're trying to uh, achieve. We have some customers that will actually look for deletion events over in SharePoint and trigger based on a deletion event occurring. So that as the records manager, your end users have the power to delete content, clean up content, which isn't necessarily a bad thing, but you have the ultimate say about when it is disposed. Right? So it's different to cleaning up the front end of SharePoint and disposing of the record itself. Right? And uh, we have a customer over in New York that runs that as part of their case file management system. For at the end of a case, they want the case manager to be able to clean up all of the clutter. So they move things into an archive folder and they delete everything else. And we have different triggers that run off where that content goes and when it's deleted. So, yeah. so with the vast amount of metadata that you have, and I'll show you this in the rules in a moment, it sounds cliche, but the sky's kind of the limit with how you design that. I mean, push comes to show, you still have the manual process. You do, yep. And nothing gets machine deleted. So one of the big differences between the likes of Office 365 and Fox is if you are running a retention, at the end of that retention, one, it just gets deleted, and two, it actually goes through the multi-stage recycle bit process. 
So you do not have a defensible stance until like 93 days after that deletion occurs. And even then you have to go and query the audit logs. You don't actually have a destruction certificate there that proves that the minute I said it was approved and the minute I disposed of it, it was actually disposed. During that time, someone could go into a recycle bin and grab it out and do something else with it. So, uh, to look at the rules now, which is the really fun part. And sorry, we've gone a little bit over. Is everyone happy to continue for now? And just continue asking questions. Yeah, yeah. Your interview questions are ready, so let's go. Perfect. Um, so, the rules is really the important thing to touch on here. Um, let me just zoom out really quickly and show you what my rules position tree looks like. Um, now this looks really overwhelming when people first see it, right? Reckless managers look at this and go, I don't know how to design this, right? Um, I like to sort of just set the expectation that right now, that complex looking visual diagram is managing seven different systems and asking every question on behalf of every end user in our organization. When we frame it like that, does it really look all that comprehensive? Right? All of my end users can just do whatever they want now within governance frameworks and best practice and that sort of stuff, right? But I've given freedom to the end user. I'm managing content in, generally speaking, six more places than I normally would, and the records managers have the ability to design this and evolve this as the organization changes. And all that's happening here is the gray boxes that you see at the top are asking questions. Is it in SharePoint? Is it this content type? Did it have this metadata field populated in a certain way? And the blue boxes are just the file blank categories. So the blue boxes is applying the retention. And the whole goal of this is to ask the right questions to result in a blue box. So if I know that one of my retention schedules is an invoice and I need to find all of the invoices in the system, what questions do I need to ask to locate where they are? A lot of our customers just use a mix of location-based questions and then content type-based questions. And then you can get really specific at a document level by asking metadata-based questions. And that's exactly how we got to the minor contract example is I flowed through a bunch of questions and figured out that based on where it is, the content type that it is, and the value that was populated into that contract value field, that it's a minor contract. And if we now zoom right in, I'll give you what that looks like. Now remember, this is a little bit more of a simplistic view because it's a demo environment and only have two or three minutes to get everyone up to speed with what's happening. So every time a record is created or modified, we run it through this engine. When I look at this first question, I'm asking, is it in SharePoint? And to look at that metadata that we capture, is every piece of metadata from every connector currently live and enabled in my system? Yeah, now, is that part of that coming from like the Tycomia store or? Uh, it is coming from any field that is associated with any item we ingest it as a record. We bring all these different content types and all that other yep. If we're targeting and picking it up, it all comes across for every connector. It's automatically mapped, so you don't need to map every field. It's not like your SharePoint admin needs to call the records admin and say, hey, we created a new field or a new content type. It all comes over the first time a document or an item that's being managed is populated with that field that runs through our engine. Right, this all gets automatically built out. You also don't need to scroll like that. If I'm looking for certain fields, I'm going to see there's custom DMS fields that I built for a customer. If we look for those contract fields, there they are. If we're going to look for things even like, this is really going to test people's knowledge. Do you know what a compliance tag is? The API. you want to play with this? David, have you seen, have you seen this through the migrations? Yeah. So that's the ADG label for anyone that's in an E5, which is an advanced data governance suite. That's the even though cool stuff that only comes out through the API using the, the office track. So there's, there's, when I say there's more than enough metadata, there's more than enough metadata. <laughs> Once we've selected the criteria, we just keep asking more and more specific questions. Right? It's really quite simple. It just follows a simple logic that we designed with you to begin with. So is it in SharePoint? I can answer yes. Which you can see here, or I can answer no. If I answer no, I've just got some really simple sub questions. It's not a SharePoint, is it in OneDrive? So OneDrive, is it in Box, or the file shares, or Exchange? Right, so I just start building subtrees, and in a future release, we're going to have all of these nested and everything to make them a little bit tidier from here. We know that that contract that we created. 
uh, procurement was in SharePoint. It was in the finance side. So we're going to continue to the left. It was, uh, sorry, it wasn't in the first library. It was in a contracts library. And then finally, we have this question here that's looking specifically at that metadata value, whether it was greater than 100,000. And it was 75,000, which means we answered no, and it became a buying contract. So that's how that flowed through that process. Let's come back to that library now. There's our contract document. I'm going to grab it. I'm going to move it over here in the invoices. This is something that record, no, that non-record users do all the time. They just randomly move things around SharePoint. Uh, what typically happens when SharePoint moves an item, unless someone wants to jump in and answer it for me, it's actually the right thing that happens, but for a record management uh, perspective, it's the worst thing that happens. Uh, SharePoint doesn't lose it. SharePoint copies it and then deletes the original. Right? And when we copy something, what do we get brand new? We get a new GUID, we get a new uh, URL path, we get a new version history, we get a new audit history, and then that deleted item gets deleted and opens the original record. So in a lot of other tools that are out there, that movement process actually ends up creating two records, a new one that's not accurate from a continuum perspective, and then an orphan one that's now lost because the original content has been deleted. Uh, this was a huge problem in earlier versions of SharePoint, earlier versions of our platform. We had to build set to flag functions, it's a manual process, it was painful. Right? We have worked tirelessly, both internally and with the Microsoft product teams to rectify that issue. And so now that I've moved that over to the invoices library, we can see when we come in here, not only is it now in the invoices library, but the whole metadata profile has changed. Just a quick yeah. Yeah, is that available in the new product or is it the current product? This is the this is the current product, yes. Yeah. So, so this, this is, is what we're seeing now. That's the current available. Yes, this is the latest. This is what most of our customers are on now. People flock to this thing when it came out. In the US, I actually had this conversation with a customer today. I think of all of our customers in the US, I have three that are not on this yet. Um, so everyone's either moved to it. All new customers are going onto this. The only customers that were going into our on-prem uh, previous version, um, not the on-prem cloud, because the cloud's completely replaced now, but the on-prem version were Canadian customers that could post data in the US. That was it. So they're still using Office 365 in most instances, but we were using a hybrid of on-prem to cloud. Now they're 100% cloud with a hybrid down to on-prem is the way that the data flows. So we can see that contracts in our invoices library, its metadata profile has changed, its contract, uh, its content type has changed. So let me come back over to Records 365 and hit our browser. <laughs> Anyone notice anything different? Retention. Retention. Five years, it's now seven, eight days. All right, we're getting that amber alert up. All I did was move it, didn't change anything else. If I open it up, you can see the category has changed to invoices. Right? We moved it into invoices like that. If we come into the metadata, we can see obviously there's the new retention, etc. But down here, notice how all those contract fields have gone. Right? They disappeared because they're not relevant to the current version of the record anymore. Then when we come down here, we have all of these new invoice fields. Right? Where it's inherited any metadata that's automatically populated once it moved over. You will notice, however, that the one field that stayed the same was that term set value, because we have that term set populated in both library locations. So any metadata that's consistent across those different locations will stay consistent unless there's other inheritance rules in it. The final thing is you'll see something really obvious, like the library name changed in invoices. Now that's great, that's telling me what the current state of the record is. But that doesn't mean that I wanted to ignore that it was a minor contract and had contract metadata and things like that associated with it. So now when we come into the version history, this is where the records are continuing. It's very important. Even I didn't edit the document, I now have two record versions. Versions haven't changed in SharePoint, but over here we have a separate version. Because the first version is still telling me that it was a minor contract. It did have a five-year retention associated with it. It did have all of this contract metadata. It didn't have any invoice metadata there and any other changes that it had back there. And so as users change content, whether they edit the document, whether they move it around SharePoint, we're tracking that. 
in all aspects. And we're ensuring that the record continuum is always intact, so that even after it goes through a defensible disposal, you can come back at any point and litigators can actually look at the entire history that that item has gone through. Every change, every edit, every move, everyone that did everything to it, a little bit big brotherish, it's right there. And from a data privacy perspective, that's important because as the content changes and moves, and that data potentially changes and moves with it, we need to be able to identify, Vaughan has put in a DSR request, I've got to go and find every piece of data that we have on Vaughan, right? And I can't just hope that someone didn't take away the social security number, or what if Vaughan's name changed? Uh, how do I start to look at all the versions that Vaughan has gone through in our system? And so we help do that by indexing all of that for you. And the final thing that I'll touch on, not to, uh, not to go into length, because obviously this can get really long, is we have full disposal, we have full physical records management, we have bilingualism, we have advanced search capabilities. Uh, when I show you the advanced search, you can actually see that every one of those metadata fields that I scrolled through before is available here, and you can add multiple conditions to the search. Uh, advanced search doesn't really impress anyone these days, but we've had advanced search in all of these systems for a long time, and you can do some of this searching over at SharePoint as well. So the one thing that does help when you are managing seven different systems, all with a central file plan that you need to be able to apply to everything, is really getting into the analytics and the intelligence that goes around with that. And so here's one of our out-of-the-box dashboards that actually provides me with some really key metrics as a records manager. Firstly, on the far left, I can actually see the success rate of my rules engine. Right? That's key number one. The whole idea is to have my record categorization read sum there as close to zero as possible. That means my rules are doing everything right, and I'm a very happy records manager. I've had some customers that go live without their rules even in there yet, so they spike into the hundreds of thousands of unclassified, and then they clean them back up over time. The second metric, and arguably the most important one, is how many items do I have overdue for disposal? You'd be surprised for anyone that's used a legacy ECM tool how difficult that number is to actually get, right? It's one of the most important things we do. So you can run that report as regularly as you want to say I've got 160 items that are overdue for retention. I should probably go and, and action those. Yeah. Would that 160 include holds or would those holds be excluded? That would not include holds. No, so once it goes on hold, we remove it from all disposal activities whatsoever. So you'd actually see, if I show you the disposal list, it removes from that list. There is no way to carry out the disposal unless you're the full record administrator god mode person and you take it off of the hold. Uh, but obviously we can track that in the audit history that you can't change. So Jeff, if you decided, no, I'm going to get rid of this stuff, and you got rid of it, the binary's gone, that's unfortunate. But add an audit history list that re is retained forever that tells me that you are the one that took it on hold and then disposed of it. <clears throat> there is a destruction certificate and metadata other stuff that's left over. Yeah. So you go and destroy a binary, we'll go and shred it, delete, we'll encrypt it, we'll get rid of it, it's irrecoverable at that point. We don't care whether we've got the copy in SharePoint, whether we have a copy in SharePoint and Records 365, they're both completely purged from the system at that very moment in time, and we capture who started it, who approved it, who executed it, and when it was actually initiated. So you can see every step of the process in the audit history. Yeah, if somebody goes into like, a library and believes the document that has like, a profile, uh, mm -hmm. um, how does that work? Um, so we have a couple of different options there. So firstly, we capture deletion events. So you can actually run a report that says, show me everything with an audit history log of deleted in the last week. We have a customer in Washington State. It's actually a customer down in Olympia that does that very thing. She has a classification rule set up that if anything gets deleted, it gets changed to transitory deleted, right? And then she goes and looks at everything that was deleted every day. And they're a small company, they're about 200, 300 staff, thereabouts. So it's not like we're talking tens of thousands of people, but she gets the final say on whether that should have been deleted. And then she can restore, and then she can actually go back and say, Jeff, what are you deleting all this stuff? Right? It's just, yeah, no, it's David for sure. Um, that scenario, was it moved to the recycle bin or is it moved to another location? So in that scenario where as the end user I delete something, it's the standard deletion where it goes into the recycle bins, right? So you could restore it. If six months go by, it goes by and it's been purged from every stage of the recycle bin, then you've got one of two options. Firstly, we have something called preservation mode. 
This is on by default on every tenant we provision. We have some customers who turn it off, but that's probably only about 20% of our base. That preservation mode brings across the very latest copy of the binary. So we don't keep every version of it. Right? We don't go and fill up terabytes upon terabytes of, of Azure storage, only the latest version. So if I went and edited that, uh, that contract document that we created, it would purge the first version and bring in the second version, or the 0 0.2 if you've got minor versions on. At that stage, if someone deletes it, and then it goes through all the recycle bins, and then you discover six months later that shouldn't have happened, we still have that latest version that you can go and restore back. Or at that point, you may decide, look, we don't need it over in SharePoint, but we're going to maintain it for the next five years until we can legally get rid of it. Now, we do have some customers, like I said, that turn that off. If you have that turned off, then you do have a final option of only triggering it when a deletion event occurs. So the connector's watching at that point, see something being deleted, grab it for safety. Um, is there So at, at that point, if you're not running a report that's that's, that's obvious, um, there, there isn't like a there isn't like an alerting system built in natively. Uh, you could probably use something like a, a flow or something within Office 365 to say a deletion event has occurred. Um, you could potentially set up Power BI if you publish this to a uh, BI hub. You might be able to set it up so it automatically refreshes this report once an hour, <coughs> once a day, uh, and you just go there and, and look at that. Um, so there's a couple of different ways that you could help automate that process, but you still want to be looking at the metrics. And it doesn't need to be Power BI either. You can put this to Cognos, to Crystal, Tablet, it's up to you. So. Is that managed through the BI desktop? This is just BI desktop right now, yeah. But I have uh, reports hosted in SharePoint as well. And Enbridge, um, if anyone ever goes into the lobby of an Enbridge office, they have all of the natural gas pipelines, the renewables, everything. They have some of the most extensive BI dashboards I've ever seen running. It's really impressive. They have, I think it's about a 15 person BI team in Calgary. Uh, they've actually published these reports to their BI hub now. So right there, they can just toggle over all of the records team and see everything. Road trends, who's creating what, who's abusing OneDrive, et cetera, et cetera. So, and you can drill through on all of this. It's BI, so it's live. So I can toggle it and say, I only want to see SharePoint or OneDrive, and then I want to toggle it to say, I'm going to show me Jeff's OneDrive. Why is Jeff put 100 documents into OneDrive? Let me go and have a look at those. They should be in finance, right? Jeff, what are you doing? Um, so those are the sorts of things that you just don't get visibility on when you just have that core ECF platform. Hey, Joe, is there anybody on uh, Skype that wants to ask a question? I think it was just Joe. Just Joe. <clears throat> There's just questions? three people. Are there any questions, Jason? No, there's only three people. Just Jason, me, and Joe. <laughs> yep. Paul, no. Joe, and I. Yep. Okay. Yeah, it's uh, I, I want to be I want to be respectful of time, so sure. it's seven fifty-six. So, um, are there any more questions, or are you wrapping up your presentation? Yeah, so I mean, obviously, we can go into a lot more detail on some of the other aspects, which we won't do today. Um, but uh, uh, the one thing I will say is we have a couple of different portals online where you can actually get all of this information. We have a knowledge base at docs.recordpoint.com that I'm happy to share out the link to. We also have a trust portal. So for anyone that wants to see in terms of service, security statements, service descriptions, trust centers, GDPR readiness, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Basically anyone that's doing a cloud threat risk assessment, which is everyone <laughs> these days, uh, we are very, very transparent with that process, uh, send that through. That's all hosted online as well, so you can get to that today. And finally, if you want a closer look at some of this stuff in your own time, if you just simply go to YouTube and type in Record Point, like a lot of other companies out there, we have all of our demos, all of our webinars, all of our tutorials published on there. So you can hear me doing my stuff, Eric doing her stuff, our CTO talking about things. And the final thing that I'll mention that we'll be demoing um, uh, a lot more in 2019, as we come back from the, the Christmas break, is our uh, intelligent classification engine. So the one thing that you saw with my rules model there is it was based around the metadata. 
the MICE engine, as I like to call it. It's actually going to be looking at the binaries themselves and use Azure ML to automatically classify for you when you might not necessarily know that it's an invoice because of the metadata. Oh, no, 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 I'm talking about machine learning with an algorithm that will actually be trained over a four to eight week period, but then on ongoing basis, but you'll actually be able to open up the training module. I think I actually have, you know what, I normally don't show this, but given that you're a special SharePoint group, it's been more than 10 years. Is this is based on an AI algorithm? It is. <laughs> so, uh, the very simple thing is, take training and it. Um, it's based on an AI algorithm. Which is why it's... Well, no, Dolph well, is different. So I don't have anything in there just yet, but you can see in one of our early production environments that uh, I don't think I realize I have access to. Uh, we have our intelligence module uh, built in here. This is where you will actually do the training. So this is where, like any AI, you kind of have to say, this is a dog, this is a dog, this is a dog, this is a cat, right? And then every now and again it will say, I'm not sure if it's a dog or a cat, you tell it's a dog, right? And then as you train it, it gets smarter. So it's this is an invoice, this is an invoice, this is an onboarding form, this is a report, etc. You will train it, and over what we think is a four to eight week period based on our testing at the moment, you will then see it will start to classify. And the way that will work in is not to replace the rules, but to supplement them. So that when we come into the rules, rather than just picking criteria in action, that's not built in this environment, you'll actually get an intelligence option here. So it would be like the magic wand to say, if it falls through the bottom and we weren't able to identify what it was just based on the content type and the simple things, run the engine over it. And the machine learning will then do the heavy lifting for you. And that will help in the unstructured repositories, not just SharePoint, but file shares, OneDrive, etc. So. Yeah. so your OneDrive rules now are basically, if it's in this folder, apply this rule set. Pretty basically. Uh, Enbridge have taken a great stance. They are leveraging... Uh, well, they have full E5 licensing for one, so that's the caveat. But they're actually leveraging the labels. Um, they don't use retention, they can't stand the retention piece, but labels they've used really well, where they've set up two labels in OneDrive and four labels in Exchange. And when the labels come through to our service, we have rules that look at which label has been applied and then apply the file plan and retention based on that label. So that gives people in OneDrive this really great way of not saying, hey, you have to do records management in OneDrive. But guys, here's a label. If you think it's this, just tick it, right? Just, it's a really simple decision for them to make. Is it and basically just metadata applying to it? Yep. Okay. Yep. It's just you publish it out centrally from the admin console. Okay. Uh, and it also can uh, go across the AIP and full Azure stack now as well. So uh, at least they're saying it is. I haven't worked across all of it. Uh, the whole idea behind the labels technology is I can not just label the modern workplace stuff, but I can go across Azure and label things as well. So we can ingest all of that for you and then manage it accordingly. So I actually think that was a brilliant mechanism that Enbridge used because obviously metadata is limited in OneDrive, but labels can be published out. So, and they've got those same labels across their exchange contents as well. Now I didn't show you all the other connectors. Sometimes I'll do a demo where I just dump in seven different documents to everything so you can see it flowing through. But I think you get the picture at this stage. So, um, and we have our exchange online connector getting some advanced features early next year as well, where you'll be able to triage down to folder levels, domains, things like that. So I can actually say, don't just pick up all of Jeff's emails, only pick up the ones that come from a certain domain, or that he puts in this folder, or that he puts this label on, things like that. So I can get a lot more specific. Exactly. Ignore, yeah, anything from that record point, just move to spam, you know, that sort of stuff. One question real quick. Most of us are on the GCC. Mm -hmm. On GCC, flow is not available. Sure. Yep. Um, there's a lot of uh, new feature sets that are not available to us yet. How mm -hmm. does that impact uh, records? So, uh, great question. Uh, we actually delayed our move into GCC. Uh, we were uh, talking to a we were in very advanced negotiations with a federal government agency, which was going to be the, the catalyst. Um, and just to show that, the reason why we've opened our Canadian data center is the first federal Canadian customer came online, right? They signed their contracts as part of that commitment to open up that data center. Same goes for GCC, we're on GSA pricing, we've got everything sorted, we just haven't turned it on yet. The reason that we were waiting, um, there was one fundamental reason, is Postgres was not available in GCC. Uh, it is now available. So there's no technical limitations. 
we don't use event receivers, we don't use flow, we don't have web services, none of that. So the only thing that's stopping us from going into GCC now is our desire to go into GCC. Uh, and at that point, we just need to be sponsored in by the first customer. So You were talking about um, some of the benefits that you can always create a flow. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, no, you can't. <laughs> I mean, we can't even so, so that was that was an example based on the reporting there. Um, so yes, um, you wouldn't be able but to create a flow. But by the end of this year. Maybe. <laughs> the, the one thing I've learned about GCC is all of those time frames in the tables are, yeah. uh, are soft at best. So, it's um, Microsoft time. Yeah. Has, has Teams launched in GCC yet? Yeah. So I have a little bit of a Teams okay. is not a full function. Right, okay. Because some of the, I'm assuming the VoIP infrastructure is not there right. yet, because that's still it's largely Skype, right? Some, some security. Well, the right. VoIP is there. It is there? Um, yeah, okay. it, and it's, it's still Skype for business. It, it hasn't transitioned yet fully over to Teams. Still okay. So yeah. the Teams yeah. Skype uses a slightly different back-end engine for their, their voice over IP. Right, okay. So the, the, the one that Skype uses is allowed, but the one that Teams uses it also is not one of the things. they're still leveraging Skype. Mm -hmm. And you also have to enable Yama. Right, okay. Yeah, um, right. rather than using the IAM with then Skype for business. Right, okay. So we actually had support for Yama, but well, we technically do support it because our older platform still supports it, but we haven't built the Yama connector. Instead, we're building a Teams connector. So right now, we manage Teams content, Teams and Groups content. So any binaries that are stored in Teams, because everyone knows that behind the team is just a SharePoint site, so it's pretty straightforward. Uh, but additional things like wikis, calendars, those sorts of things are all managed. Uh, because the conversations are actually powered by the different pieces of infrastructure, uh, we're building a specific connector for that. Uh, so that'll be our uh, tentatively Q1 calendar next year. So. Uh, so that'll be around. So GCC will be coming. Um, it's just a matter of, you know, we don't want to power up a data center and, and sink costs into a data center instead of R&D until we have customers that are ready to go into that data center. Uh, one of the first ones was actually going to be City of Tacoma, funnily enough. Uh, the reason for them needing Record Point in GCC was going to be the CGIS information, but they actually decided to not offload that to Office 365 at all at this point. So, now, don't they have a mesh environment where they're using business site as well as GCC? I couldn't tell you. I, yeah, I'm not that familiar with their, uh, their actual application that stuff. So uh, we have an SI, I uh, just don't share in there doing the bulk of the delivery. We have uh, the minimal uh, heavy lifting in the back end of the record. Point. A quick point for everybody, I took a picture of this. Is it okay that I posted it on the meetup site? As yes. Some people, are, you know, they, they don't want to be Trump. Yeah, Just a little bit of photoshopping. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's all that's hair. Thank you for asking. One thing that we should do in the future, Lorna, because um, Tacoma had sent out the with traffic and everything, they weren't going to be able to make it. So we should probably, once we have the Skype meeting, put the Skype meeting on the meetup for people to see it. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I wasn't aware there was a Skype meeting until I, I joined, so I think that'd be great. No, thank you all for uh, for coming. I know it's getting late in the night, oh, so we'll yeah, let everyone know. And, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Feel free to take the swag. Uh, if you haven't looked at this, um, it's a multi-pronged. Yeah,